Good morning. My name is Lou Miller. For 46 years, I worked in public education as a teacher, administrator, and consultant. For 20 of those years, I taught American history. Today, we're going to be talking about the election of 1860, the election that brought Abraham Lincoln to the presidency. Lincoln was the greatest politician of his day. Yet two years before his election, he was a political unknown nationally in the United States. We're going to tell our story in three parts. In part one, we're going to see how Lincoln, through his driving ambition, made himself into a national political figure. In part two, we will see how the team that Lincoln assembled overtook the front runner for the Republican Party nomination and made Lincoln the nominee instead. And in part three, we will see how Lincoln directed a national campaign that took him to the White House. We begin our story in 1858 in Illinois, where two men wanted to be US Senator, Abraham Lincoln and Stephen Douglas. Let's meet them now. This is Abraham Lincoln in 1858. He was 49, four years older than Stephen Douglas. He and his wife Mary had been married for 16 years and had four children, including one, Eddie, who had died at age four. Lincoln had been in politics since his 20s, but aside from one term as a congressman, a term that had ended 10 years before, he had little to show for it. For several years, he had kept he had left politics and built a successful law firm in Springfield, while also keeping an eye on the national scene. He made good money. In today's dollars, between $100,000 and $150,000 a year, in part by doing a lot of legal work for the railroad corporations that were beginning to dominate American politics, American business. When in 1854, a piece of Senator Douglas's legislation called the Kansas-Nebraska Act, threatened to open the Western territories to slavery, Lincoln jumped back into politics. For him, slavery was a moral, not a political issue. In his speeches, he repeatedly quoted the Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. He somewhat reluctantly joined the new Republican Party, formed to protest Douglas's act, and assembled around him a team of friends and politicians, almost all lawyers like himself, men he had known for decades. They were the ones who would help him secure the Republican Party nomination, and we will meet a few of them shortly. Lincoln was a political pragmatist, and believed it was unwise for a politician to get too far ahead of the public because you couldn't win elections that way. With public sentiment, nothing can fail. Without it, nothing can succeed. He avoided making enemies. For example, one group that he despised, the anti-immigrant, anti-Catholic movement called the Know Nothings, would help elect him president in great part because he avoided publicly calling them out while often disparaging them in his private letters. He was also ahead of his time in understanding the role of the media, newspapers and books, in influencing public opinion. And as we will see, he used the media to influence opinion towards his point of view. And finally, Lincoln was a man of surpassing ambition. As his law partner said of him, he was always calculating and always planning ahead. His ambition was a little engine that knew no rest. This is Stephen Arnold Douglas. He was known as the Little Giant because he was just five feet four inches tall. Douglas and his first wife Mary had two sons, but then giving birth to their third child, Mary had died, and a few days later their infant daughter had died as well. Douglas was devastated. Eventually, three years later, he remarried to a Washington socialite half his age. 
He had been a nationally known senator for over a decade. Like Lincoln, he was also a supremely ambitious, self-made man. Arriving in Illinois in his early 20s, he was in the state Supreme Court by 27 and a senator at 33. As one politician said, he was a pure political animal, gaining power and influence through his backslapping political friendships and backroom deal-making. He was also a fervent believer in the union, a sort of mystical belief among most Americans, including Abraham Lincoln, that the United States was the light of the world in showing the common, that common people could govern themselves without the need for kings or emperors. But there was a dark side to Douglas. He was a white supremacist, believing that the non-white races were inferior to whites. Now, to put his racism in context, in 1860 America, virtually all whites believed in white supremacy to some degree. But even in a pervasively racist society, there are degrees of racism. And Douglas was at the extreme end. His racism led him, as compared to Lincoln, to a completely amoral position on slavery. He didn't care whether voters were for it or against it. Whatever you want, gentlemen, that's what I'm for. He was a slaveholder himself, in fact, something he worked hard to hide from his northern public. It seems his first wife was the daughter of a wealthy southern planter, and as a wedding gift, the father gave the couple a Mississippi plantation. To cover this fact, Douglas had the property placed in his wife's name, but he still took the income from the property. He was also corrupt. Again, in the context of his time, many politicians were corrupt. But Douglas made himself wealthy through his corrupt deals. He then used his wealth to further his political ambitions, building a mansion in Washington, D.C., and throwing lavish parties with over a 1,000 guests at a time, with liquor flowing freely and fine Cuban cigars available for his political friends in attendance. He was also, unfortunately, an alcoholic, drinking day and night, during political speeches, during campaigns for office, and on the Senate floor. His addiction would, within a few years, have a tragic end. Having met our main characters, we begin our story in 1858, where an election for senator from Illinois was taking place. In those days, senators were not elected by the popular vote of the people, but by state legislatures. Douglas, a Democrat, was the senior senator from Illinois, finishing his second term. Twice before, in 1852 and 56, he had come close to his party's nomination for president. Now, he needed to secure his Senate seat once again before making sh what he felt would be a successful bid for the presidency. Lincoln had become the informal leader of the Illinois Republicans and had installed his supporters throughout the party leadership. He then decided, rather brilliantly, to make the 1858 election for state legislators a contest about who they would support for the Senate seat. When voters voted for their state legislator, they would in effect be voting for either Lincoln or Douglas as their senator. To take his case straight to the voters, Lincoln challenged Douglas to debates over the major issue of the day, whether slavery should be allowed to expand into America's Western territories, something Lincoln opposed and to which Douglas said he didn't care. Douglas, fatefully, as it turned out, accepted Lincoln's proposal to debate. It is interesting to speculate how events could have been very different for Douglas if he had refused and there had been no Lincoln-Douglas debates. Lincoln's national stature was greatly enhanced by his performance. With no debates, there would have been no national stature. As for the debates themselves, the historian Alan Guelzo summed them up well. For Lincoln, slavery is the problem. For Douglas, it's the controversy about slavery that's the problem. Douglas's goal is not to put an end to slavery, but to put an end to the controversy. With interest in the election quite high throughout the state, two Chicago newspapers sent shorthand specialists to each debate 
to sit on the stage and record a running transcript of the speeches, which were then printed in the next day's papers. These newspaper reports of the debates were important to Lincoln, and he actually delayed the start of one debate because one of the transcribers had not yet arrived. We will soon see how Lincoln used those transcripts to enhance his national image. On election day, the Republican candidates actually outpolled their Democratic counterparts in the popular vote. But Illinois was a heavily gerrymandered state, and while Democratic candidates received only 46% of the popular vote, the legislature that resulted was 54% Democratic, and it speedily reappointed Douglas to his third term as senator. After losing the debate, Lincoln did something unusual. He collected the debate transcripts that had been printed in the Chicago newspapers, cutting them out of the papers himself and pasting them into a scrapbook. He then pitched the scrapbook to various Illinois publishers, asking them to bring it out as a book, but he found no interest. Much later, he found a publisher for his project in Ohio. The book of speeches was finally ready for distribution by 1860. Copies were handed out to the eight delegates to the Republican convention. And once Lincoln became the Republican nominee, the book became a surprising success with the public, selling 15,000 copies a month. To keep the book price down, Lincoln had insisted to the publisher that he did not want royalties. The hardback book sold for what today would be the cost of a paperback. Lincoln was thus able to influence national public opinion during the presidential campaign through the power of the arguments in his book, especially as opposed to the arguments of his then Senate opponent and now presidential opponent, Stephen Douglas. Douglas actually complained about the book even though it contained a true record of what he had said. The book as published was also the first time that Lincoln's name preceded Douglas's when the debates were mentioned. In January 1859, just after being denied the Senate seat, Lincoln met in the Illinois State House Library with the leadership of the Illinois Republican Party to discuss who they wanted to back as their party's nominee for president in next year's election. There were about a dozen people in the room, but besides Lincoln, we will focus on two. David Davis was a 300-pound judge who had accompanied lawyers like Lincoln around central Illinois twice a year for over 20 years as they brought the state courts to each local county courthouse. During, that, during those years together, Lincoln and Douglas became friends. Now they were both members of the, Link of the Republican Party, determined to get a Republican into the White House in 1860. Norman Judd had started in politics as a Democrat. In fact, some years earlier, he had torpedoed a previous Lincoln attempt to gain the Illinois Senate seat. Now, outraged by Douglas's Kansas-Nebraska Act opening the territories to slavery, he had switched parties and become the leader of the Illinois Republican Party Executive Committee. He was a savvy political infighter, as we shall see. The group sitting in the library began debating which of the candidates for the party's nomination would be most capable of winning the key northern states that would decide the presidency. Several names were mentioned, but there was no mention of Lincoln, and he grew increasingly unhappy. Finally, he could take it no longer. Why don't you run me? I can be nominated, I can be elected, and I can run the government. There was an embarrassed silence for a moment, then a series of hasty comments. Why, of course, Mr. Lincoln, that's an interesting idea. Yeah, let's give that some thought. As the men left the meeting, Lincoln said, I am glad we have had this little talk. I feel much better for it. As we shall see, of all the men in the room that night, Davis and Judd were two who would play key roles, working behind the scenes, playing the politics that ensured that Lincoln became the Republican nominee. Later that spring, Lincoln secretly bought the control of an Illinois German language newspaper, which then began to produce editorials supportive of his candidacy, some actually written by Lincoln himself and translated into German. <clears throat> 
there were an increasing number of German Americans, both in Illinois and throughout the Midwestern states. But up to that time, they had consistently voted Democratic. That would begin to change. This is the Cooper Institute, a new college in New York City that had an auditorium that could hold 1,500 people. What does it have to do with our story? Well, it seems that in New York, there were a group of Republicans who were unhappy about the prospect that their senator, William Seward, a co-founder of the Republican Party, was likely to be the nominee for president. Seward, who we will meet shortly, had been in politics since the 1830s and had built up a number of enemies. This group, the Young Men's Republican Club, were actively seeking an alternative to Seward and invited a series of politicians to New York to speak before them in what was essentially a tryout for a part, the part of Republican nominee for president. Based on his 1858 debate showing against Douglas, the likely Democratic nominee, they invited Lincoln. He could not accept fast enough and then spent weeks carefully preparing his tryout speech. At over 7,000 words, it was the longest one he ever wrote. Because of the interest in what Lincoln had to say, the site of Lincoln's speech was moved from a small church in Brooklyn to the Cooper Institute. Lincoln once said, Brady and the Cooper Institute made me president. Here's what he meant by that statement. Lincoln arrived in New York in February 1860, just three months before the Republican nominating convention to be held in May. East Coast sophisticates generally considered people from out west, like from Illinois, to be uneducated hicks and rubes. But the New York, the Young Men's Republican Club had read Lincoln's debate performance against Douglas in the newspapers, and they were impressed. Now they wanted to see him in person. Lincoln, for the occasion, had paid for a brand new tailor-made Illinois suit and then tossed it in a travel bag where it had become wrinkled during the two-day journey to New York. Now he had it on, <clears throat> wrinkles and all, with the right sleeve shorter than the left, as he made his way on the day of his speech to the studio of the celebrated photographer Matthew Brady. Brady specialized in making people look good. His process included photographing his subject, then having an artist touch up the photo. It was the Photoshop of the day. And then re-photographing the artist's cleaned up version to present as the finished product. This is the iconic picture that Brady produced the day of Lincoln's speech. And as Lincoln himself said, this photo, along with his speech that night, helped make him president. Why? Up until this time, hardly anyone in the American public knew what Lincoln looked like. When he was nominated for president three months later, there was a great demand in the newspaper for a picture of him. And Brady's photograph of Lincoln was the one that was used over and over, showing him as a striking figure of statesmanlike character and purpose. This is the picture that introduced Abraham Lincoln to the American public. As for the speech itself, Lincoln argued that simple morality compelled opposition to slavery. There could be no middle ground. He concluded with a rousing call to arms for his fellow Republicans. We Republicans must not be slandered from our duty by false accusations against us. He was referring to the charge that the Republicans had financed John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry. Nor frightened from it by menaces of destruction of government, which were the threats that if a Republican was elected president, the Southern states would secede. Let us have faith that right makes might, and in that faith, let us to the end dare to do our duty as we understand it. Lincoln had actually capitalized that last sentence in his own handwritten version of the speech. Following the speech, Lincoln gave a copy to a New York newspaper and spent hours that night proofreading the typeset version until it was perfect, ensuring that it would be published the next day as he had, de had, had delivered it. 
and then transmitted by telegraph to newspapers all over the country. The speech and the ecstatic reviews that it received put Lincoln on the national political map. This concludes part one of our presentation. In part two, we will see how Lincoln gained the Republican Party nomination for president.